Hello everybody, my name is Mohan Sadek, and this is the third part of a three-part lecture, Cardiac Arrhythmia Mechanisms. We've already discussed ECG foundations, arrhythmia mechanisms of bradycardias, and now we're moving on to arrhythmia mechanisms of tachycardias. Here are the objectives for the medical school block regarding tachycardias. We will go through all of those um, in sequence. So here's the tachycardias. We've already gone through the bradycardias, which were over here. We're now moving on to the tachycardias. We like to break them down into narrow complex tachycardias and wide complex tachycardias. And I'll go through this uh, in a minute. Now, a tachycardia is any rhythm with a ventricular rate of more than 100 beats per minute. Symptoms include fatigue, chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, also called presyncope, loss of consciousness, also called syncope, and sudden death. One of the objectives asks to recall the general and specific mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. There are three main mechanisms. The first one is abnormal automaticity. The second one is triggered activity. Both of those are disorders of impulse formation. The third one is reentry, which is a disorder of impulse conduction and is responsible for the vast majority of abnormal arrhythmias. Abnormal automaticity we've spoken about before. We talked about how pacing cells within the, within the heart, such as the AV node or the sinus node or the hesypicage system, are able to auto-depolarize and generate action potentials on their own. So they have, um, they're automatic in that way. So, and they could have blunted automaticity, which can lead to bradycardias, but they can also have increased automaticity, leading to tachycardias. Triggered activity is an abnormal process where there is an early after depolarization. So under usual circumstance, the action potential has to get back to phase four before another depolarization is triggered. But in this case, there is an early after depolarization that triggers another action potential. Triggered activity is responsible for polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and can be either early delayed act after depolarization, which can lead to torsad, We'll talk about torsad during this lecture, or delayed after depolarization, which could be caused by the joxin toxicity. The joxin is an antiarrhythmic or a rate controlling agent that is used in atrial fibrillation and heart failure, and increased levels can lead to um, triggered activity related arrhythmias. Reentry is the most common cause of tachyarrhythmias, and one of the big concepts is that usually depolarization occurs in sequence in that the sinus node depolarizes first, then the atrium, then the AV node, then the his system, then the ventricles. So there is one road um, that leads to the end. If there are multiple pathways for whatever reason, this can lead to re-entry. So here's an example where there's two pathways that can lead to depolarization distally. And normally the electrical impulse will travel down both path pathways at different speeds. If for whatever reason there's an extra beat, such as a premature atrial contraction, for example, that blocks down one pathway but goes down the other, it can now go around and spin around all the way back and then continue to propagate itself in a reentrant mechanism until something stops it. That's what reentry is. So for re-entry to occur, you must have two pathways uh, or two limbs that allow a re-entrant circuit. So one of the objectives, so that was the three mechanisms of tachycardia. We will now move on to describe the algorithm and mechanisms of narrow complex and wide complex tachycardia. One of the big um, concepts that I've discussed in the first part is that to have a narrow QRS complex, depolarization must proceed through the his system and both ventricles must depolarize simultaneously. If one ventricle depolarizes before the other because of a disease his system or depolarization does not occur through the his system, the QRS complex will be wide. So, if the, if the tachyarrhythmia is originating from the atriums, 
and goes through the Hesperkeshi system and both ventricles co contract simultaneously, you will have a narrow complex tachycardia. In the tachycardia, all the QRS complexes will be narrow. If you have a uh, rhythm originating from the ventricles, you will have a white complex tachycardia. Or, if it's originating from the atrium, but there's disease in the Hesperkeshi system, you will also have a white complex tachycardia. So this is the breakdown, and it's important to break it down this way because the clinical implications of these arrhythmias are different. Narrow complex tachycardias are mostly non-emergent and could be treated medically. White complex tachycardia could sometimes be emergencies and lead to sudden death. Hence, we try to separate out uh, the morphology on ECG. Let's first discuss narrow complex tachycardias. There are multiple types of narrow complex tachycardias. If there is, if the, and we call them SVTs because we know they're coming from the atri from the atria, so they're supraventricular tachycardias above the ventricles. If it's an irregularly irregular tachycardia, the main cause of that is atrial fibrillation. There are other things that can cause an irregularly irregular narrow complex tachycardia, but they're rare. If they are regular, then it could be sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, or atrial flutter. Junctional tachycardia is a rare arrhythmia, which is more common in neonates, and we will not be discussing it today. This here is an example of a narrow complex tachycardia or what we call a supraventricular tachycardia. This must be coming from above the, above the ventricles. Let's start with talking about sinus tachycardia. So here's an example of sinus tachycardia. You have a P wave that has a normal axis, so it's positive in 1 and 2, hence it's coming from the sinus node. Sinus tachycardia is sinus rhythm with a rate of more than 100 beats per minute and could be a very normal physiologic process. For example, if somebody is running on a treadmill, the heart rate, the sinus node will um, will be signaled by the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system to increase the heart rate, and the rate, the heart rate will go up to 120, 130, 140, but it's a normal rhythm. It's sinus tachycardia. And if you do an ECG, the P wave is still coming from the sinus node. It's positive in these one and two. Also, in somebody who is ill because of septic shock, pulmonary embolus, uh, trauma, losing blood, the heart rate will compensate by increasing and they also have sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia is usually a reactive process to whatever is happening. Now, I always tell my trainees never to treat sinus tachycardia. If somebody comes into emergency with an elevated heart rate, 120, 130, and the rhythm on ECG shows a sinus tachycardia, they must be compensating for something, whether they have septic shock or pulmonary emboli, etc. And if we artificially lower the heart rate with medications, we can actually take away that comp compensatory mechanism and make the patient worse. So it's, all, it's important to find out the underlying cause, what's causing the heart to have sinus tachycardia. Moving on to atrial tachycardia. Normally, the electrical impulses originate in the sinus node. But if a different part of the atria takes over, for example, the pulmonary veins and back of the left atrium are common causes of atrial tachycardias. So if cells within the pulmonary veins take over and start depolarizing at a faster rate than the sinus node, then they will suppress the sinus node and take over the rhythm. For example, this is an example of a P wave that's negative in one and two. This P wave is not coming from the sinus node, and it's coming from somewhere else. This is an ectopic atrial tachycardia, and it's suppressing the sinus node. Hence, it's taking over the uh, electrical impulses within the heart. Moving on to AVNRT, AVRT, and atrial flutter. These three are re-entrant mechanisms. And AVNRT is the perfect rhythm to understand, um, or the perfect arrhythmia to explain how re-entry can cause arrhythmias. So some people have both a fast and slow pathway within their AV node. Normally, uh, we conduct down the fast pathway 
through the AV node to the Hesperkg system. However, there are a group of people who have also a slow pathway. And under normal circumstances, the sinus rhythm starts in the sinus node, goes through the atria, and goes down both the fast and slow pathway to the AV node, Hesperkg system, and down to the ventricles. However, if there is an extra beat, for example, a premature atrial contraction, this can block in the fast pathway of the AV node and go down the slow pathway of the AV node. And now, as it goes down the slow pathway, it will conduct to the ventricle, but at the same time, conduct up the fast pathway to the atria, down the slow pathway, up the fast pathway, down the slow pathway, in what we call AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, AVNRT, until something stops this. And because you're, we're spinning within the AV node, down the slow pathway and up the fast pathway, the atria and ventricles depolarize simultaneously. So the P wave will either be within the cuirass complex or at the terminal deflection of the cuirass complex. Hence, you see what we call a pseudo-R at the end of the cuirass, but it, act, it actually is a P wave. And here's an example of AVNRT on an ECG. AVRT is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, and it also relies on a second pathway going down to the ventricle, but it's not within the AV node. As it happens, most of us have only one pathway from the atria to the ventricles, and it's within the AV node. Some of us have a slow pathway and a fast pathway within the AV node, and this could cause AVNRT. But there are a group of people who are born with an extra pathway going from the atria to the ventricle, and we call this an accessory pathway. It's usually congenital, and uh, we're born with it, and it could be asymptomatic for our lifetime, but it can also present with arrhythmia. It could occur on the left side of the heart or the right side of the heart, between the right atrium and the right ventricle, or between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And because signals are going down both the AV node and the accessory pathway, you have two ways to go down the heart, from the atrium to the ventricles. And we, like we talked about, whenever there's two ways to go around something, there's a potential for re-entry. Now, it's important to understand that the AV node has decremental properties. It delays depolarization before it reaches the ventricles, and hence we have a PR interval. Accessory pathways, most of the time, do not have the same properties. Actually, the electrical signals arrive and go through right away, without being delayed. Hence, there is sudden depolarization between the P wave and the QRS, and we see slurring over here with the loss of the PR interval, or shortening of the PR interval, and we call this a delta wave. And here's an example of what a delta wave looks like. So you get a very a, a P wave with a very short, short or absent PR interval. Well, not absent because the P wave is part of it, but a very short PR interval. And then there's slurring, which we call the delta wave, into the QRS. And this is called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This is an example of an ECG of a patient with wolf parkinson white syndrome, and this patient clearly has an accessory pathway. As you see, the PR interval is very short, there's slurring of the QRS complex, and there's whitening of the QRS complex. So this is what we see when there is signal coming down at an accessory pathway, not just the AV node. Now, because you have two pathways of conduction, you can also initiate re-entry. So if there's a PAC that comes down and blocks either in the accessory pathway or the AV node, so let's say this PAC blocks in the accessory pathway, it will go down the AV node, but now the conduction will go up the pathway, through the atria, down the AV node, up the pathway, through the atria, down the AV node, and now you have re-entry. And this can lead to supraventricular tachycardia. So, due to, the presence of the, due to the presence of accessory pathway, you can develop a supraventricular tachycardia, and here you see that a normal sinus rhythm, 
in the absence of an accessory pathway, you can only go down the AV node. But if you have an accessory pathway and you have a PAC, you'll go down the AV node, up the pathway, down the AV node, up the pathway, etc. And here's an example of AV nodal, sorry, <laughs> here's an example of atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. Atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia, where the person has an accessory pathway and you, they're in SVT. And once you interrupt this and stop it, you'll see that in sinus rhythm, they can have a delta wave and a very short PR interval indicating that there's an accessory pathway present. Atrial flutter is a re-entry circuit within the right atrium. And it's quite nice to, and easy to recognize in that it has a saw, sawtooth pattern. So here's a, it's like a chainsaw. A sawtooth pattern in the inferior leads, especially in leads 2, 3, and AVF. And you see it here on the ECG. And these, this sawtooth P wave is re-entry within the atrium. And here's what atrial flutter looks like. Sorry, re-entry within the right atrium. And here's what atrial flutter looks like uh, on a 12-lead ECG. So you see a sawtooth pattern in leads 2, 3, and uh, AVF as well. And it, like I said, it's re-entry within the right atrium. So for some reason or another, there is a short circuit in the right atrium, and there's re-entrant propagation in the right atrium that suppresses the sinus node. And this will keep going until something prevents it. Most of the time, it's in a counterclockwise direction, and you get this negative P wave morphology in the inferior leads. It can also go the other way in a clockwise direction and you get a positive P wave morphology in the, in the inferior leads. Both of them look like a sawtooth pattern. Here's the reentrant SVTs, AV and RT, where you have reentry within the sinus node, sorry, <laughs> reentry within the AV node, going down the ventricle and up the atrium. And here you see that the P wave is very close to the QRS because they are depolarizing simultaneously. Here is a VRT where you have an accessory pathway and you're going down the AV node, up the pathway, down the AV node, up the pathway. And the P wave is separated a little bit from the QRS. And here you have atrial flutter, which is a short circuit within the right atrium and it is sawtooth pattern in the inferior leads. The final supraventricular tachycardia I'd like to talk about is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is what is described as multiple wavelets in the left and right atrium with atrial chaos. So there's multiple short circuits happening at the same time in both atriums, and both atriums are depolarizing at a very, very fast rate. The reason we can stay alive with atrial fibrillation is because the AV node prevents these impulses from going down to the ventricles with that same speed. So the decremental properties of the AV node serve to limit how many of these impulses can go down to the ventricles. But what you get with what you get is an irregular input to the ventricles. So atrial fibrillation um, presents as an irregularly irregular rhythm on the ECG. And if you feel a patient's pulse with atrial fibrillation, it will feel irregularly irregular. When you look at an ECG for atrial fibrillation, you'll see irregular QRS complexes and no clear P waves. There's just a lot of, um, you know, a wandering baseline, but there's no clear P waves. And here's a 12 lead example of atrial fibrillation. As you can see by looking at the ECG, the rhythm is irregularly irregular and you can't really identify any P waves. There's no sinus P waves here. It's just um, a wavy baseline. So we've concluded the narrow complex tachycardias or the supraventricular tachycardias. We talked about sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, and atrial flutter, and we've also discussed atrial fibrillation. We'll move on now to the wide complex tachycardias. And like we said before, the reason these wide complex tachycardia have a wide QRS is because they're they're either originating from the ventricle or going down a disease hypertension system. In the case that they're originating from the ventricle, 
there are four different types ventricular tachycardia, pre excited tachycardia, pacemaker mediated tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation. Let's talk about ventricular fibrillation first. Ventricular fibrillation is a rhythm that is incompatible with life. It is very fast, chaotic activity within the ventricles that actually leads to the heart not beating anymore. It's depolarizing so fast and so chaotically that you don't actually get normal beating. And it's fatal unless terminated with a defibrillator shock. So if you allow, if you apply a shock to the heart, like you see in the movies, this will reset the heart rhythm back to normal rhythm. But if you leave it alone, this rhythm is usually fatal. And here is a 12 lead ECG caught of ventricular fibrillation. I'm not sure how they were able to obtain this ECG, but as you can see, there's fast chaotic rhythm that has replaced the QRS complexes, and there's no actual beating, mechanical beating of the heart with all of this. And the surgeons describe this as looking at a bag of worms. The whole heart is just jiggling, but not actually beating. Moving on to ventricular tachycardia. <clears throat> ventricular tachycardia is a more organized rhythm of the ventricles, and it could be either monomorphic or polymorphic. Monomorphic meaning all the QRS complexes look the same. Polymorphic meaning the QRS complexes are changing. There are different causes of ventricular tachycardia. Monomorphic ventricular tachycardia can be caused by scar in the heart, so, for example, if a patient had a heart attack and now they have a scar in their ventricles, that can lead to ventricular tachycardia. It can also occur in normal hearts as an auto automatic mechanism. For example, right ventricular aphotral tach tachycardias are ventricular tachycardia seen in normal hearts. Polymorphic tachycardias are due to usually an acute process. So if there's active ischemia, for example, a patient is having a STEMI and there's a blocked artery, they can develop polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Or if they have what's called long QT, so they have a long QT interval because of, because of whatever reason, that can lead to torsade de point. And torsade de point um, looks like a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So this is an example of a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. This patient had an infarct of their inferior wall and is now presenting with a, a very fast ventricular tachycardia. So you see that it's wide complexes, very fast, and it certainly does not look like sinus rhythm. This is a wide complex tachycardia that we classify as monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. All the QRS complexes look the same, so it's monomorphic. And this patient will require treatment for this because this could lead to fatality or uh, syncope, etc. This, on the other hand, is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So it's not as fine as ventricular fibrillation, which uh, we saw before. There are, there are QRS complexes, uh, but they keep changing. And this is what we call torsade de point. Torsade de point, there is a reduction in magnitude and an increase in magnitude. Reduction and an increase. And torsade is usually caused by prolonged QT interval. So if you look at the ECG, you see this prolonged QT interval that can lead to torsade. What are things that can cause long QT interval? Where well, there are many causes. It could be congenital. Some people are born with genetic problems that can lead to long QT. It could be secondary to metabolic disorders such as hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia, or it could be caused by medications. We will talk about treatment of long QT in the next treatment lecture. Pacemakers can also cause tachycardias, and this is usually easy to diagnose in that you see pacemaker spikes on the ECG. So this is a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. For some reason or another, the pacemaker is firing very, very fast, and you see the pacemaker spikes here, and it's causing the heart to go very fast. Now, there are multiple causes of pacemaker mediated tachycardia, which can also all be programmed around. So if this is happening, one can apply a magnet to the pacemaker to stop it from doing this, and then the patient can make an appointment with the device clinic and we can reprogram the pacemaker so that whatever caused this doesn't happen again.
The last white complex tachycardia is pre-excited tachycardia. And although we haven't talked about this yet, you're all familiar with it. We talked about how if somebody has an accessory pathway, electrical signals can go down the AV node and up the pathway, down the AV node and up the pathway, and that causes a narrow complex tachycardia. Well, you can also go down the pathway up the AV node, down the pathway up the AV node. And because now you're not going through the Hispergenchy system, you get a wide QRS, and what, what we call antidromic AVRT. So this is AVRT, the same um, rhythm that causes a narrow complex tachycardia, but when it goes through the pathway and up the AV node, it looks wide, and it causes antidromic AVRT, which is a wide complex tachycardia. Now this person, once you get them out of the tachycardia, you will see delta waves on their ECG, because they have an accessory pathway. So usually it's easy to diagnose in retrospect. And after we got that patient out of this arrhythmia, we see the delta waves on the ECG. So this is this person has WPW and they had antidromic AVRT. Both supraventricular tachycardia or antidromic AVRT can occur in the same person, whether it goes down the AV node or down the accessory pathway and up the other way. So here's one other concept to understand. We need to be able to understand that there's a difference between ventricular tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy. So we talked about rhythms that can cause wide complex tachycardias from the ventricles, like pacemaker mediated tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. But rhythms originating from the atriums can also cause wide complex tachycardias. How is that? Remember how we said that for the QRS to be narrow, depolarization has to proceed through the hisperication system and both ventricles must depolarize simultaneously. So if there's a diseased hisperication system and the QRS is wide at baseline, then any atrial arrhythmia will lead to a wide QRS tachycardia. For example, this is sinus rhythm with left bundle branch block. As you can see, because of left bundle branch block, which is a disease conduction system, you have a wide QRS. So now, if you develop supraventricular tachycardia, so tachycardia from the atriums, such as atrial flutter, AVNRT, AVRT, sinus tachycardia, that would lead to what looks like a wide complex tachycardia. But it's coming from the atria, not the ventricles. This is a ECG of right bundle branch block. Again, you see that the QRS is wide, and if this person goes into supraventricular tachycardia, they, have, they will develop a white complex tachycardia because they have a white QRS to begin with. So you can have SVT with a barency, meaning a white QRS leading to white complex tachycardias. So supraventricular tachycardia or narrow complex tachycardias are always coming from the atria. Sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, AVNRT, AVRT, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation. But white complex tachycardias could be either coming from the ventricles, which are the four that we talked about, or they could be SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, with an aberrant QRS complex, with a wide QRS complex, and so they look wide. So white complex tachycardia could be anything on this list. Narrow complex tachycardias are only coming from the atrium. This is an example of SVT with aberrancy. Here we have a white QRS complex, and the patient is having an SVT, in this case AVNRT, but it looks like a white complex tachycardia because the patient's QRS is wide at baseline. And once you get this patient out of their rhythm, you'll see that the QRS is wide in sinus rhythm. So we've, discussed, we've uh, gone through all the objectives. Define tachycardia, it's any rhythm more than 100 beats per minute. Recall the general and specific mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. Describe the algorithm, uh, those are increased automaticity, triggered activity, and re-entry. Describe the algorithm and mechanisms of narrow complex and wide complex tachycardias. If the QRS is less than 20, 120 milliseconds, it's narrow. If it's more than 20, 120 milliseconds, it's wide. If it's less than 120 milliseconds, it must be coming from the atria down a healthy hispergation system.
if it's more than 120 milliseconds, it's either coming from the atria down, uh, down the hypocrisy system in an abnormal way, so you get a white QRS, or it's coming from the ventricles. We also discussed the different mechanisms and types of narrow and wide complex tachycardias. Thank you very much. Please feel free to forward me any questions or concerns that you may have.